Welcome everyone. Just give folks a couple minutes to get settled here. Good morning to you as well, and thank you for having us. Yeah. So as everybody's joining, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm just going to ask everybody to put your name and email or your name and tribe um, that we're reaching today in the chat, if you can, uh, before everybody gets busy with coursework. Thanks. Well, I can still see some folks joining. Um, I'll just start introducing myself um, while folks join. And it's great to see the, the list of names uh, populate in the chat with where folks are from. Um, uh, my name's Colton Miller. Uh, I, uh, 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 I'm here to give this uh, kind of introduction to data science and R. Um, I, I uh, go back uh, with Laurel to our time at the University of Washington. And so um, I think uh, it was really exciting when she kind of brought up this opportunity. Um, I, I, I definitely said, yes, I can, I can help out. And I think it would be really exciting. Um, uh, and uh, it's been, couple years since I've been in my graduate program uh, and uh, I've been working uh, I say as a forest and fire ecologist for Vibrant Planet uh, but really it's it's a lot of remote sensing and GIS work there um, and uh, we're focused on uh, um, uh, developing decision support software tools for uh, forest health treatment prioritization, mainly in, in dry mixed conifer forests of Western US and heavily, heavily focused in California uh, landscapes. Um, uh, throughout my, my time at the University of Washington, I did uh, take a number of statistics courses and used R for my work um, and uh, ended up doing, you know, the, the TA programs to fund my, my time there uh, where I uh, also, you know, stood in front of the classrooms and uh, uh, did labs in R um, as well. Um, so I have some kind of pseudo teaching experience with this. Uh, the work that I um, put together for this webinar uh, is heavily built on both that experience, uh, um, some uh, kind of books and, and uh, uh, other kind of uh, 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 trainings that I was able to find online. Um, and so it's kind of a combination of coursework from the UW, uh, kind of online examples and tutorials, and then uh, a couple data sets that I, I um, gathered just for this course. So uh, while you'll see that I, I do link to a number of different uh, resources for folks to use, the actual materials and, and coding that we'll do is developed solely for this uh, webinar. And, and hopefully you'll find it useful to go through that and, and learn and experience that. Um, 
So um, because there's so many folks here and they're continuing to join, uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, we'll have time to go around and do a full round of introductions. Uh, I think because I, I'm a little uncertain exactly how long the, the um, tutorial work will take today, it would be great to jump into it a little bit and then uh, we'll see how the time goes and if, if we do have some time, um, then we can come back and do some more kind of in person or um, verbal with your microphone introductions. But for now, I, I've been uh, following these comments in the chat and um, and and seeing where folks are from, and and I think that um, that's that's really excellent. Just to see the variety of of different um, uh, people and places that everyone's from. Um. I'm going to add a comment into the chat. I have a link, I'm just gonna post it to start. And then I'm gonna see, I don't think you can pin anything in here, um, but I can repost it again if needed. This is to, this is actually to uh, right now to my Google Drive. Um, we may transfer kind of these materials over to um, to um, uh, the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society later on, but this is where you can find all of the materials that I generated for this webinar. And um, I will just start to screen share and go through some of those for you now. Um, first of all, I will just highlight this link should be, um, oops, sorry, let me make sure you can see. Can somebody confirm what I'm sharing here? Is this are you just seeing my desktop with the um, Google Drive up here? Yes, that's what you have. Up. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Thanks. Um, so everyone, I just said this, anyone with the link should be able to access this. Um, so you all should be able to get it from from the link uh, in the chat there. Um, uh, if you want to share this, you should be able to just share that link. I will leave that active uh, until we, you know, until at least until we find a better way to host these materials and probably just indefinitely uh, until um, till I forget about it and, and, and just leave it on my Google Drive because it really doesn't take that much space here. Um, so feel free to share this content. Uh, feel free to download this. If you come to this, I presume this is what you see when you just visit it. Um, although I'm logged into it, you'll see something similar to this. And uh, I didn't go through uh, all of the details of downloading the content from the Google Drive. But um, if you just click on uh, the name of this folder, you can just download the whole contents of that folder locally to your drive. Uh, I will say, that as it is right now, uh, I have just loaded up the content for this today's topic, and we have a couple more weeks of additional topics uh, that I need to generate and add additional content to. So if you do download it today, which I, I, I'm going to recommend that you do uh, as much as we can go through things together uh, for the content today, um, uh, uh, you may end up having to re-download, um, you know, next week if you join uh, and continue on. Um, for me, I'm just going to access what I have from my local drive, uh, uh, which is just a mirror of what I just uploaded. Um, so to start, I have this uh, tentative schedule. We'll see how well we can hold to this. Uh, if you uh, have to leave for something 
or you get bored and just decide to quit um, or, you know, leave partway through, uh, things should be fairly well set up that you can jump back and follow on your own. Uh, I do think it's really helpful to, to have repetition and go through as much as you can with somebody else uh, to start, especially uh, as if you're a new um, comer to R and coding. Um, but that said, I've tried to develop this uh, content as much as it, as it can be to be worked through on your own as well. Um, you'll see I have kind of a set of slides followed by an introduction. Um, this should say slides again, uh, or sorry, slides followed by an exercise. This should say slides and then followed by an exercise, a little bit of a break, and then slides followed by an exercise. If we go back to the folder structure, you'll find those slides um, in each of these, uh, and they're kind of labeled one, two, three to help with the order, and they also have the names that match that schedule, and then the exercises um, also ordered one, two, three with the names. Uh, you'll find the data. Um, uh, this one actually uh, uh, shouldn't be there when you first download it. There's just two data sets to start. And then uh, I will be uh, starting all of the scripts from scratch. Um, uh, but you'll find some saved in this uh, folder. I'm almost hesitant to even show you this for now uh, because uh, you'll find that they're relatively simple when you open up a script and look at it. Um, but it's really, really recommended that instead of opening this and just running line by line through it, that you, you actually type in the codes as we go. That's going to be the best way to get your practice and, and um, familiarize yourself with what you're doing is actually going through the steps of typing out the codes and the functions and running them. Um, because simply reading them can be helpful for some, um, but going through the exercise of typing them and having it kind of go through your eyes or your, kind of your hands and your eyes and that whole sensory experience is uh, in and of itself like a, a learning and kind of imprint on your brain of like what it was happening more so than just kind of running through and reading what what that that code says. Um, uh, but uh, you'll see that I do have some scripts saved here. Uh, I, I did I forgot to put the numbers of them, um, but the names do correspond to um, the same naming uh, as as prior. So if you miss something or whatnot, you'll see that those are also there for you. And then there's some supplementary reading, which are just uh, really just like helpful. Um, you'll see like, for example, a, a reference card that tells you some like reminders about different functions or operators. Uh, there's like a help um, kind of introduction self-help guide. Uh, so you can work through some stuff on your own and read some of that and things like that. So for now, uh, without further ado, I'll just jump into this intro slide deck, um, which really the objectives for today are just get comfortable with, you know, what is R, what does it do, and what does coding look like in R? What are some basic functions and statistics that we might use when we do coding in R? Uh, for those that missed at the start, my name's Colton. Uh, I've I've been in natural resources, you know, since I was an undergrad, um, in in kind of uh, forestry context. Um, I worked as a pre-sale forester with the Quinault Indian Nation, and so you can see me here with one of my timber sale projects uh, after after it was logged there. And uh, like I said, I, I did teach some R uh, as, a, as a graduate student at the University of Washington. And now I work as a forest and fire ecologist with Vibrant Planet. Uh, I just wanted to cover a little briefly, like what do we talk about when we talk about data science? This is like at its core, turning raw data into understanding, insight, and knowledge. And so I kind of just put these icons out here as like, 
what does this whole process entail? Uh, we're out, you know, in the field often. Uh, we're, you know, in this environmental setting. There's, there's uh, your biotic, you know, things like uh, um, trees, animals, fish. Uh, there's some abiotic variables out there, your, your topography, elevation, slopes. Um, there's weather conditions. There's all sorts of things that we could go outside and we could measure. Uh, we could count things. We could count observations of animals. We could measure the weights of things or the, the diameters or the heights of trees. Uh, we, you know, we, we could start to uh, think, you know, we really like how many things could you go out and measure? Um, it's near infinite. And really what the data science is, is starting to understand how can we investigate patterns between those things and try to create some insight to which either some kind of decision could be made or some kind of understanding or knowledge could be generated from those measurements. Um, so usually, you know, we start in the field, we go out with some kind of tools um, to measure things or um, take counts, and then we trans transfer that data into a spreadsheet uh, or a table. And uh, from there, we kind of have, well, this, this question part could probably be put before we even go out in the field. Um, but uh, we have this stage where we have to ask, like, what do we want to understand? What is the intent of collecting this data and, and, and analyzing it? What kind of relationships or patterns are we trying to model or understand? And that's where you come in uh, with your now skills that you'll learn here uh, or that you already have and are transferring into R or whatever it is. Um, you know, this is kind of the approach uh, with this programming is like now you have a lot of data and numbers. And we want to consolidate that into some type of figure or chart that allows us to communicate to a group or a, uh, you know, a um, interested party, some concept or idea. Uh, uh, and, and so this is kind of the whole process, right? Um, so we're going to go through how we can start to do that with R. Uh, we're really focused in this on the fundamentals of coding and data science. Um, you'll see in this course, like it's totally designed for beginners. There's no prior experience needed. Uh, and some of the limitations of that being that we're not going to give you uh, the comprehensive statistical foundations to understand what all of the, the meaning of the things we calculate might be. We're not going to tell you exactly what questions you should be asking about your data. And we're not going to give you the exact tools that you'll need to answer your questions. And so those are some of the hardest things for you to start piecing together once you have an understanding of what's possible in R uh, and what's possible with this type of or this kind of way of understanding. Um, and there's many ways that you could understand data or understand the world that you live in. And this is just one of those paths. Uh, and if you haven't been exposed to this path before, you probably don't know what kind of questions you could ask and answer with this path or what kind of tools are available with this path. And so this is intended to kind of be that exposure to help you start thinking down that route. And hopefully what you'll find is that this course is not enough for you, right? You'll find that this course is too introductory. It was too... Uh, too much of just the fundamentals and you need more. That's what we're hoping from this. Um, and so don't feel discouraged if you come out of this class or this set of um, uh, you know, webinars and you feel like, 
I still don't know what to do with my data. Do you feel like, hey, I um, I can bring my data into R, I can do some stuff with it, but I'm not sure I'm answering any questions because I don't know what questions I should be asking about my data. Those are kind of higher level um, uh, things that will have to uh, be more specific to your individual use case in your individual data. And hopefully what will happen is that you'll respond to Laurel and Sean, uh, who invited me to do this, and you'll say, hey, that was really engaging and interesting tutorial, but here's what I really need to know. Uh, and those are the kind of like uh, prompts that will be helpful for them to de develop additional content to kind of, uh, or ask for other folks, you know, like me to develop additional content to help curate some program more specific to uh, asking ecological questions for, you know, uh, fishery science or something like that. Um, modeling, you know, fishery populations uh, um, specifically. Um, and you'll, so you'll see kind of this thread throughout the, the tutorials is like, I don't know what questions you're asking. I don't know what tools you really need. I'm just focused on the the fundamentals and and the beginnings of somebody who hasn't used R and hasn't coded what they'll need to know to get started. Uh, and I've put my contact information here throughout, and you have you know the contact information to the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society um, uh, to to prompt us if you need specific help uh, with with that um, for you. So um, with that, we'll say like, what is R? It's this free open source statistical software. So anybody can download it on your computer for free and use it. Uh, it runs on, on you know, any, any, essentially any computer system, Windows, Macs. Um, and uh, it's been around for almost 30 years. Uh, and it was originally designed by Ross Haka and Robert Gentleman. Um, and uh, won't go into too much more detail about what it is, uh, but why we want to use it, it's free, it's reproducible, it's collaborative, it's repeatable, it's open source, which means that there's other people developing resources for you to utilize in it, and it has incredible data visualization, which we'll see a little bit more of next week. We'll be interacting with R in a couple ways. Uh, well, in, in one way, really, but um, uh, here's the three kind of elements that we'll interact with R. We're going to need to download the R software, which is really the heart that runs the actual lines of code. But we'll be running that code. We'll be using R Studio, which is the program that we'll use to write the code and run it. And that's what's called this integrated development environment. It's essentially what we say a set of tools that makes working with R more convenient. Um, you'll see that it's very convenient, very easy to use. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that's what we'll open is a program called R Studio. So we'll download both R and R Studio. And then not today, but uh, next week in the event more and more as you get more into R, you'll start to work with packages, which are kind of add-ons to R. Um, R has what's called its base code, and then it has what people have developed additional code add-ons that need to be installed to provide additional fun fun functionality. Um, and those are very easy to install. Another kind of benefit of R is that uh, a lot of people are creating these packages, and they're often very easy to install and load into your your library or set of functions that you can use. Um, R Studio is really nice because you can work with multiple files. Uh, you can view variables. You can do color coding stuff in there. Has built-in help. It's really quick to run uh, lines of code. Uh, and and I, I really just think you'll find that once you start using this, it's just the way that you want to interact with R um, from here on out. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. 
So R itself, if you look open the R program, would just look like the console. And you could just type and get responses in here. R Studio is kind of this combination of windows where you have this code editor. And this is where we'll type our scripts and save the script. And when we run a line of code from here, it'll return that line and whatever that line um, responses down in the R console. And then we can also see uh, things in the workspace in history, and we can see plots and other things in this uh, plots and files window. So it's kind of what it is, is it's this different set of windows that allow you to view multiple components of what's going on all at once. Um, and in our studio, you can run code. I, I, hit, I have this control and enter. That's Windows on a Mac, it's command and enter. Um, but we'll go through that uh, in the exercises. And then when you save your script, you'll save what's here and it has a .r extension. And that just saves this set of things. But essentially when you save that script, everything that you've done in this whole R Studio set of windows should be reproducible just from this script. So from bringing in your data, from running commands, from creating plots, all of it should be reproducible from your script. And then the, the nice thing is you could share your script. And if somebody has your data already, or you send them their, you know, share your data as well, they could also reproduce all of the work you've done. Um, and so uh, 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 if you ever need to repeat an analysis, or you're doing a very similar analysis on a different data set, or you found an error and you need to change something and repeat, you know, nine tenths of your analysis because you have this script that has stored all of the work that you've done. You can easily go back to that and make the changes that you need to and rerun things. Uh, you'll see before as we go through um, the exercises that we'll be doing a lot of commenting on our code, basically by adding these um, uh, hashtags, octothropes, can't remember what they're like actually called in the in the um, symbol world, um, R will ignore whatever follows that symbol. And so it's really, really highly suggested that you comment your script as much as possible, add these symbols and just say, this line of code does the following. What it uh, and um, I guess I have several things about what where to comment. Can we comment at the stop at the top of your script? Here's what the whole script does. Generally, this script loads a data set, you know, called fish length, and it calculates the mean size of fish under 300 units in length. Um, I wrote this script. You know, my name's Colton. My email is, you know, this. And I wrote it or started it on, you know, March 28th, 2023. And then when you go back to it, or if somebody else goes back to it, there's some details to kind of recap big picture what's going on. But then additionally, as you're writing each line of code, comment what each line or section of code does. This line of code subsets the main data set to only fish under 300 units of length. And then there'll be that actual line of code that does it. This line of code calculates the mean of the data set. You know, eventually you may find that some, some functions are just so basic or fundamental that you're not commenting every one. But in general, you should comment as much as you can what each line or each section of code is doing. What's the purpose and what does it do? Um, especially if you ever use an unusual function or code is un, uh, hard to understand or whenever an algorithm or something is particularly useful and you say, hey, keep in mind this piece of code because you might want to use this again later. Uh, I mentioned we'll be saving our R script because you can repeat that whole analysis from that R script again later. We won't save our workspace 
uh, which is like, you'll see when you quit R, it asks you if you want to save your workspace. That includes like all of the objects and things that you've assigned when you've been working through your script. You really don't need to save those because it should all be reproducible from your script itself. Um, it's best to not save your workspace because that will give you an error if it's not reproducible from your script and force you to fix it so that it is. Um, so uh, uh, that's the kind of the general recommended thing. I I uh, have just highlighted that here. Don't save your workplace workspace. There are obviously um, uh, caveats to this and reasons why you might or might not follow this recommendation. But just as a beginner, when you're getting started, this is a good place and way to format your work. And then I just want to highlight a couple last things uh, before we move into downloading the program. I want to highlight this concept of pair programming, which I think is really, really a useful way to think about working together with somebody else. And this is where you'd have two or more people together programming to, you know, to accomplish some task. And you'd have a driver and a navigator. The driver would be the one actually typing onto the computer and entering the codes and, you know, typing in the functions and hitting them. The navigator would watch the driver's activities, would suggest, you know, maybe what functions to use would say, hey, I see an error or a problem with the way you've typed this, would ask questions of, you know, why do you think this would be a better way to run this code than this? Um, or I would think about longer term strategies of, here's how we might organize this script, uh, uh, you know, from top to bottom. And really uh, now the driver is kind of the play by play, you know, person just, typing the individual functions. But to keep it, you know, fun and, and interactive, then you want to switch who's a driver and who's a navigator. And that way you can both be engaged and both understand and, you know, engage in that conversation of what's the code doing? What are the functions are doing? You've both contributed and you both understand, you know, overall what's happening. Um, but it can be a really useful way to combine you know, minds and engage in this kind of activity of coding and programming uh, and, and, and learn from each other and accomplish things. Often what you'll find is it, it, it doesn't take any longer to do a task than it would have for one person to do it uh, or each to do it individually, right? And then the final comment uh, really that I wanna make is that, um, if you're at all familiar with R already, you may have heard about base R versus tidyverse. These are essentially two fundamentally different kind of ways to program. Base R is kind of, it's the functionality that's already built into the R programming language. Um, and so any like initial download of R will function with base R. Tidyverse is a collection of packages that you load into R, has its own kind of style ethos, stance on data analysis. This has become kind of a controversial topic of like which style of coding do people want to use. Um, for now, at least for this first tutorial, I'm just using base R. Uh, I don't have a strong um, you know, horse in the race between these two, uh, except that I learned on base R and I'm most familiar with base R. And if you ever need help, I'll be much easier to help you in base R. Um, I'm not recommending that you stay in base R. I think it's nice to learn a little bit of both. Uh, but it's definitely easier for me to teach you to start, uh, from the start in base R. And then we can see later on if we want how to do some similar functionalities in tidyverse. Um, but I just wanted to throw this slide as in a reference if you come back to this and you wanna like learn a little bit more about the tidyverse or some of your collaborators say, 
hey, I'm coding in Tidyverse. Uh, this will remind you to come back to here and look into Tidyverse a little bit more. And hopefully once you're like comfortable with a little bit of coding, then you're say, hey, I can go through a Tidyverse tutorial on my own. I've, you know, I've been in R, I've coded some stuff. I can go through a step-by-step -step tutorial in Tidyverse, and then I can decide, you know, which route that I really want to take. Um, but for now, what we'll see today is just base R functionality. Uh, here's a number of tutorials, or I mean, uh, references. A few of them are just kind of books, additional kind of like intro references to books. This one's the Tidyverse one. And then these are where you go to download R. And then here's how you can get help. I've included my email, the reference material both here or in the um, course download packet in those readings. Um, you can in R put a question mark and the name of a function and run that line of code and it'll throw up a help page for that. Or also really commonly, once you understand kind of the lingo and vernacular of what you're trying to do, uh, really commonly, you know, I still Google things every day for what I'm trying to do in R. And to be a good, you know, good programmer, really what you do is you get good asking questions on Google. Um, uh, and usually, you know, that involves just asking, asking question and, and adding R to it or sometimes adding R in the name of a package that you wanna use. Um, so I've, I've just thrown some example questions here that you might follow. Okay, um, I'll just pause for a moment if there's any questions there. I really hope that at least my hope is while this is kind of a webinar um, that folks can download and follow along uh, uh, with the coding data set uh, tutorials as we go. Um, and so I've built in these exercises and my hope is that I'm not just doing them and demonstrating coding to you, but that you're also engaging in it as we go. Now, that said, uh, I, I didn't really foresee or think about at the time how challenging it might be for people to download programs if they're on government computers. Um, uh, uh, and I don't know how many of you are, um, but I will just go through this and I would encourage people to follow, follow along if they can um, and uh, download R. So um, again, I'll highlight, I'll just paste this link back in the chat. Um, data link. So you can download the um, the uh, um, kind of course data. I just said course data link. I don't know what, um, but download this. And then I'm going into the exercise one. You really don't need to uh, follow in detail exercise one here um, because we can kind of do this um, ourselves. Um, uh, oops, let me just organize my screen here. But you will need to download at least the data set um, here. But to download R, I mean, you can just literally Google R. Uh, and that will bring you to this page, R Project for Statistical Computing. And I've written out some details about things in this exercise, uh, but there's not a lot to it. 
we can go to this download link for CRAN, which is really just um, going to be a link of like different mirrors, which are a number of different uh, places that host the R software. You can download it from any of them. Sometimes it's fun to go find one that's kind of close to where you are. Uh, so I'm in Seattle. I go find Oregon State University and click on them, but they're all the same. You're not going to download a different version of R in a, you know, from a different spot there. Uh, and then um, the trick here is to know which type of system that you're on. Uh, and um, hopefully by now you're on a 32-bit, you know, machine. Um, I'm on a Mac. You may be on a Windows. Uh, and really you just have to come in and follow the links to the latest release of your, um, of your, your uh, respective R um, uh, uh, version. You know, this was the Mac version. I have a, a M1 Mac, the Apple Silicon. So I put these details as best as I could into this exercise one. Um, if you're on an Intel Mac, this is kind of now you have to look at like your uh, about this Mac. If you go, if you're on a Mac, you go from Windows, um, I mean, sorry, not Windows, you go from the Apple logo to about this Mac. And you can see I have the M1. Somebody else might have Intel. So then you have to either do the ARM if you're M1, or if you're an Intel, you do this other one that doesn't have the ARM on it. Um, and you would just click and download that onto your machine. And you should see that um, downloading. Uh, if you're on a Windows, you would have gone to the Windows version and you would be probably, most likely, if you're following this, you would be installing R for the first time. And then you would download R for Windows. Um, and then of course, um, I already have it uh, on my computer. But once this R program downloads, you would, you know, uh, double click on this <clears throat> and run the installer, whether you're on Mac or Windows, and just follow the default uh, installation prompts through to install R. So I would just follow these default prompts. I would hit continue a bunch of times. I would agree to the licensing without reading it. And I would install R. I'm just gonna skip that for now because I have it already on mine. Um, but I will pause for just a couple moments in case people are doing that um, themselves on their own machines. I should also mention um, that I'm just generally a fairly informal person. So uh, I, if if you need help, like I said, I'm I'm encouraging folks to go through this with me and do the downloading the program and downloading the data. I expect if folks do that, 
there to be some issues or problems that arise. And I'm more than happy if you just turn on your mic and say, I'm having a problem with this or type something in the chat and we can try to solve it here, troubleshoot it on the fly. Um, so I, I'm, I'm more than happy if that happens. Uh, or if you just have a question, just interrupt at any time. So the second piece of software that we need to download is uh, our studio. So again, I typed up the, um, the exercise uh, document with a little bit more con context if you're gonna go through this on your own. For now, I'm just gonna kind of do it on the fly here which I just Googled RStudio and I just went to RStudio desktop. And uh, we've already installed R. So now we would just install RStudio. Uh, and I think, yeah, okay. So I think it already recognizes that I have a Mac here. Um, so I could just click this link to install RStudio but if you scroll down, you can also see that it offers the the different uh, operating systems that you might have, um, the different versions of RStudio that it has. And so I would just download RStudio for Mac. I would download that, wait for that to finish up. You can see that neither of these downloads are very large uh, files. And then this one for Mac is fairly easy. You just drag and drop it into the applications. I'm going to skip that step because I have it. And for Windows, I presume that you would just go through the um, the uh, uh, installer and just accept the defaults and uh, um, agree to their licenses without rating it and uh, um, let it install it. I'm not excellent at all of the system issues that you might encounter if you're on an older system. Um, but if that does come up for you, uh, feel free to contact me, you know, individually um, via email uh, at a, you know, at a later time and we can go through that together since it'll probably take a little bit extra time to figure out exactly the combination of, of program are in our studio that you need and if you guys are on a you know a government or an it controlled computer hopefully uh you already have access to some help that can uh um install things for you yeah i already see somebody who who needs authority to install things on their program um and somebody who can't reach that page. Yeah, I, I, I figured um, this must have, you know, must happen because I just don't know the, the uh, intricacies of everyone's like systems and uh, uh, controls that their IT puts on the different systems. Um, so, uh, I, sh I guess I should have thought to reach out and, and uh, ask folks to like um, request it from their IT groups, you know, before this. Uh, but it may be we just need to do that and uh, follow along for now. Or um, uh, if you have a personal computer at home, you could, you know, do the exercises at home at some point over the week. Um, So I, I do apologize to folks if they don't have access to it. And I, I would say for um, people, if they're on a, you know, a machine and they're not sure, um, you obviously you could go to your applications and just like look for whether you already have um, 
our studio installed. I'm on a Mac, obviously on a Windows, you'd have to go through the start menu in your, your programs. But it's possible uh, if you're on a on a you know a government or a agency computer that you already have those two programs installed. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, I would suggest for now we just follow along, and then um, I'd be happy to follow up with people individually to either uh, help you out uh, on your personal computer or work with you to describe to your IT folks like what you need uh, in order to work you know, in our studio. Um, I haven't seen any message messages of success. So either people are quiet or, uh, you know, um, there's only been, uh, difficulties with doing the installation and, uh, uh, learning, um, you know, uh, learning for me to, uh, make sure and we can, um, uh, okay, we got a couple of people at least. I think there there is definitely a uh, learning curve for me to uh, follow up prior to uh, people in in this group uh, for the next time. We can at least hopefully for next week um, start some threads up through system administrators and IT to get downloads occurring ahead of next week. Um, so I, I think uh, if if you guys had system problems, what I would recommend is just email this exercise one getting started with R to your system administrator or your IT and just say like this this these are the two pieces of software that I need. Um, and the getting started with R exercise that the the, the um, doc X doc doc x word document exercise should contain all of the information that your system administrator needs to understand what to install um and uh if you were successful uh i just realized when i um when i pasted the uh the last screenshot in this um exercise i didn't have a script open but when you first open our studio It'll look something like this. I like the dark mode, so I already changed my color to this. Um, but we'll always start with a new R script. So you can do a file new R script, and that will open that um, that script, which is the console editor or the code editor window. And then you see the console, the environment, and the plots windows. So these are kind of those four windows. If you want, yeah, I see a question about dark mode. Because we actually managed to get back onto time to finishing this exercise. If you want a dark mode, um, I know on Mac, it's called under tools, global options. I can't remember on the windows what, um, what uh, um, what um, menu that is under, but here you go under um, appearance, and then you can just select a different editor theme. And I uh, I can't remember what I had. Um, I think it's solarized on dark or something. So just select down there for same same for Windows. I I see in the chat. Uh, and then here you're in the console. We're ready to code and do some stuff here in our, uh, to get to this top left window, I did a, a file, a new R script. All right, we'll have another short 
This will be a really short set of slides and exercise, and then we'll take a break. And I may, you know, can stick around for some time in the break to help troubleshoot a little bit. Uh, the first, um, the first thing we're going to show in this set of exercise here is just how to uh, use R as a basic calculator. Um, and so this will be a really quick, quick uh, another exercise and um, or set of slides and exercise. So, uh, I mean, we definitely want to get to using R as a comprehensive and complex data science uh, code editor. Uh, and, and we will get there. Um, but to introduce it to us, I think it's helpful to just understand that at its core, R is essentially a calculator. Um, and so we can work with R as if it were a basic calculator. And oftentimes I do some, you know, very basic calculations in R because it's right at my fingertips all the time in my, on my computer and I'm just there. Um, and so here you can see the, these are called operators, but they're really just what we were, we're, what we're looking at is the symbols that we would type in to do some mathematical operations. So the plus symbol, addition, the minus symbol, subtraction, the asterisk we would use for multiplication, and the um, forward slash we would use for division. I usually use the caret for exponentiation. Um, uh, and so uh, we could just see how those function in R. Uh, and I apologize. I'm, well, I'm just going to do it. Uh, let me let me open the exercise. I will do it as I did in the exercise um, for people who want to follow that later, just in case. Um, I'm going to show the exercise for a minute. So I'm going to kind of switch for this one. This one time, I'm just going to switch between the slides and the exercise. Just because I want to get us like familiar with what's going on, um, you'll you can see in the exercise for those who had trouble downloading things from now, I do go through um, here um, uh, what it looks like when you first open R. I went through how to you know open the R script, and then we'll be typing here, and then uh, in here I have kind of this other font to indicate commands that I'm typing into R. And so the, and this is Times New Roman is kind of my commentary or my step-by-step -step instructions. And then this courier one is a font that's like, this is stuff that you could type into R and run. Um, so that's how I've, I've structured that exercise. Uh, so, if we wanted to see, let me make this a little bigger. I'm just typing three plus four. So if we want to run this code, there is a button here that we could run. I usually on a Mac, I do command return. And on a Windows, while you're on that line, you do control enter. And while, you know, if you are on that line, it will enter or run that line of code. And you can see we've typed it up here in the console editor. But when we ran that line, it ran it down here. The little um, uh, arrow here says that was a line that was entered from the console editor. And then the output down below is what was output from that line of code. The square brackets one, just tells us that there was essentially, it was a vector that was returned of length one. Um, so we don't need to worry about that too much right now, other than to recognize that seven is the actual output of this line of code. So it functioned as a basic calculator there. 
And um, it's gonna run a subtraction. You can see I'm putting spaces between my, um, my subtraction symbol. You don't have to have them there, but I find that easier to read with spaces between things. The spaces essentially are nothing to, um, don't mean to run anything uh, to R. So whether you put, um, I'll just do that, whether you ran this like this or with the spaces, you get the same answer. I just, it's essentially clear um, often to have some spaces in, in between things. Uh, you could do some really complex math, right? Uh, that uh, numbers that I could never multiply together in my head um, or a division that I could never do in my head. Uh, in my exercise uh, or in the, uh, well, in the exercise and if you were to open the script in the, um, in the scripts folder, uh, R is a calculator, uh, first of all, you'll see that I, I guess, let me just open this so you can see it. I do put comments for uh, what the script is when it was written, what the script does. And then you can see my comments here as well. In general, it's best to keep your script not too many characters long. You'll see um, from very old uh, computing days with the, I never did this, but um, the punch cards to run code on computers, they were 80 characters long. So there's this kind of tradition that you would just write to 80 characters. I think that's what this line is, this vertical line. Um, is 80 characters. Uh, I don't know exactly what that is. I think something like that. Um, there's some story about about this, which is like an arbitrary width now that people generally keep to. Um, for now, I don't, you know, you can comment all of this. I'm just going to say, you know, keep, you know, commenting your script. It seems almost silly at this point because we're, you know, coding such simple things and you could, um, you could uh, read and probably decipher what each of these lines was doing. And in the future, you won't comment such simple lines of code. You'll comment more complex functions that you do. But just to keep the um, the habit up, you know, doing that from the start is good. Here's an exponential three raised to the power of twelve, and then um, logs. So by default, if you just do log in R, that function is to base e. But if you do log ten of a value. That's the log base 10. All right. So just some introduction of how R is used as a basic calculator. I included a couple links just on the slide here that you can review on that. And then another thing we'll use uh, throughout the uh, following exercise um, in exercise three are these comparison operators. These are things like less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, not equal to, and so on and so forth. Um, <laughs> what this does is it returns what's called a Boolean uh, operator. It's really just a fancy name to say, it's just going to say true or false uh, uh, when you compare two values and you say, is three less than five? And R is gonna tell you that's true. 
or in this case, is 3.55 equal, exactly equal to, you notice in R equals to is an assignment. So here you have to say, if you wanna test whether two values are exactly equal to each other, you have to use double equal signs. And you say, is 3.55 exactly equal to 3.54? And R tells you, no, it's not. So let's go back here and test some comparative operators. And we can say, is three less than five? Yes, that's true. Is three less than two? No, that's false. And we could just switch the signs and see what we would get, right? We should expect these to be opposite. Now, three is, is greater than five. Three, or sorry, that's false. Three is greater than two. That's going to return true. Or the um, greater than or equal to, you say uh, three, and then you type this out like this, a greater than followed by an equals sign. That's true, three greater than or equal to five. That's false. And then, Exactly equal. Keep in mind we're doing this now two equal signs. Three is not exactly equal to that five. 3.55 is going to uh, is going to um, jump the gun and ruin it for you guys. 3.55 is not exactly equal to 3.54. But what if we ask whether those are not equal to? And these become kind of second nature. For now, you'll probably want to just keep either that R reference card or um, where did this go? Or something like this handy so that you can remember what exactly these symbols are and what uh, comparison logic they correspond to. Um, but this does not equal to is means uh, you're testing whether three is not equal to five. And that is true, three is not equal to five. Or I could test whether 3.55 is not equal to 3.54. And in fact, I got true again there. Um, so just a couple more things here that we're gonna cover. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't put this in the uh, slide deck there, but it's in the exercise notes. And we're going to get pretty used to this as we go through the next following exercise. Uh, but this is the assignment operator. Um, and uh, you can see up to now, we've just been typing in numbers and, uh, and entering their results. The environment is empty. That means we've not saved any objects to our our studio environment. Uh, we want to create an object. We're going to use what's called this assignment operator, which you get. Uh, this is the um, shift and comma followed by the dash, which is just right of the zero key. And I'm gonna enter, I'm gonna say A is three. And you can see after I entered that, nothing was returned in the console. I've just assigned A to three, but I haven't asked R to do anything with A. I've just made an assignment. However, in the um, environment here, now you'll see that's no longer empty. I have a value of A and it's, <clears throat> it's uh, or an object of A, its value is three. If I wanna look at A, I can just type A and hit run. And R responds to me, hey, you called for A? 
oh, that has a value of three. So maybe I want to assign something to B now. Okay, now I have a new variable that's called B and its value is five, right? I often like to look at things. You'll find me very often after I do an assignment or I, I do something with data, I look at it just so I can see, hey, yeah, in fact, it's what I wanted it to be, B is five. So now what if I wanted to add A plus B? That's eight, right? Well, R knows that's eight because it was able to take A, which points to three, and B, which points to five, and add those values together and return eight. Or I could do 10 times A. And I took 10, and then I looked up the value of A, which was three, and multiplied that by the 10 to get 30. So now you can see I'm actually working with things that I've assigned those values to objects in R. I could, similarly, I could ask, um, hey, does A equal B? No, it's false. I might already know that's false because I assigned A and B to three and five, but maybe I had calculated A and B from other things. And so I, had, you know, I didn't know off the bat whether they were the same values or not. And I wanted to just test that. So I could just check that with this. Um, or I could just say A is A less than or equal to B. Yeah, that's true. This was a really simple, um, a uh, demonstration of how you could assign values and manipulate them in R. We have just assigned one value to A and one value to B, and then we're manipulating A and B. Um, it seems pretty straightforward, but just as a quick demonstration of how powerful it can be to assign objects in R, I'm gonna assign, uh, um, uh, let me just, before I do that, let me just uh, let me just comment my script a little bit here. Okay. Oops, I hit save. <laughs> A little, uh, I'd like to, a little um, habitual save here. Um, uh, I'll just save mine as a, as, uh, on the desktop. Um, I'm going to say, uh, you guys, if you save yours, I will just say, um, if you've downloaded this uh, file, just don't save it in the scripts folder with the same name as the one that's already in here because these i've i've already written and saved those for you uh kind of as, as references so uh maybe you want to just say r as a calculator you can save it with the same like calculator but then just put your initials at the end um to uh distinguish that from from the uh from the script that I had written in there. So you can maintain both as references if you want. Um, uh, but uh, it, that, it, that is how you would save your script is you just going to save it. And um, just really quickly, you'll see, I just saved mine on the desktop. You'll see as it shows up as this just dot R file. And if you were to double click that later on, it would just open up, it's already open, so it didn't do anything here, but it would just open an RStudio window uh, with this in it. Um, uh, and then you could rerun this set of code as it were. Uh, <clears throat> so again, to demonstrate kind of the potential power of making assignments to objects in R, I'm just going to create a random set of numbers. Uh, and so um, our norm is going to be a set of 100 numbers. Well, I'm just going to put 100. Um, 
you can see, uh, oh gosh, when you're in RStudio, another nice thing about RStudio is it, uh, uh, when you type in the function, when you're in the parentheses, it gives you a prompt of like what the arguments are that that function takes. So <laughs> a little bit of context here, our norm is a function. The, um, the different things separated by commas inside these parentheses are called arguments. So n is an argument, mean is an argument, and sd is an argument. By default, mean is going to be 0, sd is going to be 1, but there is no default for n, so you have to enter a value for n to use this function. We could also just look at our norm. Might be useful, and just to see that this is a normal distribution. And if I look at our norm, this is how you would run it. And um, uh, our norm generates random deviates. That's all a little bit too complex for what we really care about right now. Uh, I'm just going to run it with this hundred. Uh, you can see now R has numbers. There's a hundred of them. And if we look at it, they just look like random numbers. And we'll see that they are kind of generally um, between like two and negative two. But really what we want to just see is that there's a hundred numbers there. And we can see that we can multiply all hundred numbers by two at the same time. Or we could ask for each of these numbers, are they below zero? And now what we get returned is the hundred, uh, um, a vector of a hundred where each one is true or false, whether that number, sorry, this is the R times two. So we wanna look at the original R, whether that number was below zero or not. So below zero, yes, true. Below zero, no, no. So true, false, false, true, right? True, false, false, true. So you can see how having that assigned, we're doing operations now on a whole set of 100 numbers at once. Uh, and so it's very easy to do that um, by having that object assigned in R. Okay. Um, let's see. That is the 1220 mark. So oddly enough, I how I did that, I have no idea, but that is my um, specified time for a break. Uh, so I have um, here a 15 minute break. And then, um, so I, I'll say you can save your, your script. You can close that if you want. Um, we'll just come back at uh, 1235 uh, or 15 minutes, whatever time zone you're in here. And we'll go into the exploring data where we'll import a data set here and start to work with, um, well, we'll go through the slides for it, but then we'll start to work with indexing, looking at descriptive statistics and asking some more complex questions about our data. Um, so I'll stick around for the 15 minutes in case there's any particular questions or um, things. Otherwise, you guys can just um, abscond, you know, take off for 15 minutes and we'll expect to join back at uh, 1235 and continue on. We'll go ahead and pause the recording for right now and sure. start up again at 1235. All right. Sounds good. Thanks.
I have no idea how that last uh, stuff ended up exactly on time for the tentative schedule I had. Um, obviously couldn't have planned it uh, that precisely. Um, but we will see uh, what goes on with this set. Um, we'll get a little bit more into the nitty gritty here. That was obviously just intended to get you <clears throat> uh, understanding the, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, general like framework of R and data science as a whole, get the programs some time to get, you know, downloaded with the programs, get into them, get into R Studio in particular, and just like you typed some code. So you got over some of the hurdles, uh, you know, of of uh, um, of uh, that are out there just for <clears throat> just for uh, uh, typing and running code and and programming. Um, so in a way, you could you know say that you guys have programming experience now. Uh, this next uh, <clears throat> uh, um, essentially. Uh, hour and a half or so, a little bit under, we'll uh, pick that up a, a whole lot more. Um, uh, so uh, bear with us as we go through the set of exploring data with R. And you'll see kind of um, the uh, intention of this um, topic is very heavily on what I would call the indexing set of tools in R, uh, but that's also uh, one of the most commonly used functions in data exploration and analysis. Um, <clears throat> so here in the slides, we'll learn some vocabulary and functions of R, understand some of the basic structures of our data, and then in the exercise, we'll get more comfortable with reading or writing code and how to read, how to produce the uh, kind of examples we've covered here. Sorry, I got to just drink a little bit of this coffee. The data set that I put in the folder for us to use, I, uh, well, one of them, the main one that the exercise is based on is uh, from NOAA. There's another one I put in there that's from the Washington State Department of Natural Resources uh, that I actually haven't detailed uh, much about, um, but uh, that's just, I put um, the main one that we cover is like the entire exercise is based on this NOAA one. And then I put kind of a, a set of additional questions that focus on using the Washington State wildfire data set so that if you want more practice, you can work with that one uh, because a lot of this really does take repetition across different data sets. And, 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 and um, hopefully you guys find yourselves a little bit interested enough to say, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer some of those questions with a different data set and see what I get. Um, yeah, so thanks to Noah for this. Uh, <clears throat> what, I, what I did was I just, grabbed one data set that's the fish length and weight data. And that's the one that will be based off for the majority of, you know, for the exercise. Uh, and I did clean it up a little bit just so that, you know, it, it was, you know, easy for us to work with as a beginner data set. A few things to recognize when you look at this data set, if we were just to open up the table and look at it. Um, it's made up of a number of rows and columns. Uh, each uh, row is an observation of a fish. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you can see that, for example, um, spotted sea trout appears at the top here, also appears at the bottom, but down here with a different length and weight. And so you may have repeating 
fish, you know, names here, uh, but potentially with different lengths and weights. Or by off chance, you have a fish that has the same length and weight. Um, and so these are different fish. I might think it tells us um, public use. Oh, I can't remember what. Oh, a recreational catch and effort data. Yeah, so I'm not a fishery scientist. I really didn't know much about this data. I just knew that I could find it publicly available and it looked interesting. So I grabbed it. Um, uh, 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 but each row is one record or observation. So every imagine out there, every time a recreational fisherman and fisher, fisherman, fisheries people would know a lot more about how these types of data are collected, but I'm imagining, you know, every time a recreational fisher catches a fish, they record these kind of information about it. Or, um, you know, somebody you know, is going out to collect these data from, from people out uh, uh, fishing. Um, they're collecting the common name. And uh, uh, and and recording that, and then they're collecting a measurement of the length and the weight. So overall, we would say that this data set has three columns in it. And then here we're displaying twenty rows. The full data set has many more than twenty rows, but we can see that this is we would call this a twenty by three uh, table that's being displayed here where 20 is referencing the number of rows and three is referencing the number of columns. And then each observation is a row and the different variables are recorded in columns. There's many ways that you could store or record your data, but this is the best and most appropriate way to do that for analysis in R where each row is its own observations, and then the information about those observations are stored in the columns. Um, here, a few other just kind of details that we might think about for this um, uh, data set. The common name, if we just look at the values or observations in this first column, we see that they're characters right each one is made up of some set of characters and we could group together different observation based on say for example spotted sea trout appears here it also appears down here and there's one here right we could group different fish together based on their name so we would call that a categorical variable because it's coding whether each observation belongs to a particular group these other two data uh, columns are numbers, okay? <clears throat> Pretty easy to look at and identify that, that they're numbers, but we can also recognize that they're measurements. The length, and I don't know what units exactly that these are, um, but the length and the weight of the fish. So these are continuous measurements in some numerical units. And so we'd call these numerical data. Uh, and they're continuous variables because they represent the measurements with a, a scale with units. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about how to tell what kind of measurement scale or type of data your, uh, your data is. But I have included a link down here to describe more about that if you're interested. They do. Um, uh, limit or constrain what types of operations can be done on them. For example, we could take the mean of the weights, the mean being the sum of all of these numbers divided by the number of numbers in that column. We could take that, that mean for a weight or a length field because those are numerical data. We couldn't take a mean of the categorical data because it's not meaningful to sum these values together, right? 
And so by knowing what kind of data is stored in each column can also inform us what types of descriptive statistics or functions we can apply to those data. Um, additionally, it has implications for what kind of object it can be stored as in R. I'll go over those in just a moment. This here is called a data frame. This is going to be what you'll find the most common type of object to work with in R, where it contains columns of data, more than one column of data. So it's multidimensional in the sense that there's rows and columns, but each column could contain a different type of data. So for example, we have categorical uh, data in column one and numerical data in column two and column three. Now, the one um, uh, caveat to keep in mind is that each column can only contain one type of data. So in the length column, these are all numerical. And in the common name column, these are all categorical. But because this is a data frame, we could have one column of categorical and one column of numerical. That distinguishes it from a matrix in R, where a matrix would have all columns being the same data type, either all numerical or all categorical, for example. So we don't need to go too much into the details of this. I just want to introduce these concepts and have this information here available to you as a reference. Um, but these are different classes of objects. We'll be working a little bit with vectors, which are one dimensional, and then these must be of the same data type. For example, they are all character uh, um, entries in your vector, or they're all numeric entries in your vector, or we could have a data frame. Uh, in which case you have columns and rows, but the columns could be different types of data. This is really what you'll find is one of the most common ways of storing data. And probably um, uh, uh, you'll, you'll always and forever work with data frames in R um, uh, if, you, if you stick with R. Uh, there's a number of other things we might want to be familiar with, but um, for now, I'm not going to cover them in detail uh, and just recognize that they may come up as we move forward in doing additional exercises throughout the next couple of weeks. And I may refer back to this when they do. Um, uh, but uh, that's really all I want to say about this without going into too much detail. So indexing is probably the most common thing that we'll do to subset or understand particular observations within our data frame. It's really, this is a, a overarching term to say we wanna extract or manipulate specific elements or certain elements that might, that meet specific criteria. The way we do this depends on the class of the object, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll do it um, mainly for data frames. We'll do a little bit on a single vector, but if this is a data frame and uh, we call this, we assign this to an object called size in R, then we could look at, say, for example, the length column by just saying size and then using the square brackets and we'd say, remember in these square brackets, the, remember that this data frame has rows times columns. So in these square brackets, we are gonna specify that we wanna return rows, comma, which columns we wanna return. And so here we have an empty um, uh, set for which rows, that means we're going to return all rows. We're not subsetting any partic particular set of rows. And then the two means return only column two, which is the length column. So that would set us up to just look at the set of values in the length column. 
We could similarly index it in a couple of other ways. We could say uh, call length by the name of its field or the, the column name length. Or we could say size dollar size length, dollar sign length. Uh, and you'll see this as a very common way to index to a particular common column within a data frame. So don't get too caught up on all of this now. We'll see this in action in our exercises. This, these kind of go over how powerful indexing can be. When we wanna look at what, what um, uh, observations meet a particular uh, condition. And sorry, I just noticed uh, a question in the chat. Um, and the question is, could we have also presented it as 20 comma two to get the same thing? And if we said 20 comma two, that would actually just uh, uh, return the 20th, the observation in the 20th row of the second column. But we could say one colon 20 comma two, and that would return rows one through 20 of the second column. So we'll see some more examples of that in the exercise. So, and, and this, um, I'll, I'll just pause for another moment on this side since I'm here. This slide also highlights how many different varieties of ways there can be to get the same answer in coding or programming language like R. Very commonly, you'll find multiple approaches to get to the same result. Um, and depending on how you or your collaborators might think, you might intuitively use different or alternative approaches. So while we may find ourselves very comfortable using one of these, we probably also want to be familiar with what other approaches might be out there so that when we're reviewing somebody else's code, we can understand what they're doing, um, or we can at least look up and figure out exactly what they're doing. Um, so here's just some examples of how we're now combining indexing with our comparative operators. So now we're indexing into this size data frame. So I'm calling this size, and we're looking to return the rows. So all of the columns are being returned. But I'm subsetting to rows where the length is greater than 400. So I would remove from this, I would, this first observation would be dropped and I'd come down, this one would be dropped, right? Because 277 is not greater than 400. This would be dropped. And what I would be left with is a subset of this data frame where I only have the rows for which the length field is greater than 400. Or I could say, ask for the fish that have a length of exactly 300. And if any of them are true, that would be returned by this, this query and say here, this Gulf Kingfish is 300. And because I've left this column uh, indexing blank, I would be returned with um, all three columns of this row. So it's say Gulf Kingfish 300, 0 0.28. And that would tell me all of the information about the observation of the fish with a length of exactly 300. And so you can see how I'm combining indexing with these operational uh, relationships as well. You can also combine two or more conditions. You can say, I wanna return fish with a length over 400 and a weight over one. Say, I wanna just find the big fish big in terms of both length and weight and return those. And I would say, I would be looking at this. Hey, this one's over 400, yes. This one, and I look over, this one's over one, yes. So that one can be in my data set. And I'll just come down a little bit and a little bit. Say I've looked at all of these. Now I'm on this row. This one is over 400, but it does not have a weight over one. So that would not be returned by this query. And so you wanna be able to understand logically what these queries are doing. 
and then compare that logic with the data frame that you have and make sure that you're you're returning exactly the values that you expect to because r will run code all day long but it won't tell you that the code it's running is actually the code that uh, oh shoot i forgot a comma here <laughs> um sorry about that uh, uh we'll see in the exercise um we better have commas or else that won't work properly um the downfall of, of of trying to type code in in PowerPoint is you don't have an error there. Um, um, what I wanted to say was that uh, um, there is no guarantee that R that now I'm stumbling over my words here. Um, uh, you want to be able to understand logically what you're querying for to make sure that your query matches that because r will return something but there's no guarantee that something is actually what you intended to ask for it's just what you actually asked for in code and so part of the challenge and part of the benefit of this pair programming approach is ensuring that what you actually asked for in code matches what you intended to logically ask for in terms of the question that you wanted to answer. Um, and then this question I see in chat, why don't you need to add a comma um, uh, to specify which columns to output? And, and I was just uh, commenting when I saw that, I do need to add a comma. Um, I have a typo in my PowerPoint here. Um, you always need a comma here when you're working with a data frame that has rows and columns, you always need to specify both rows and columns. The empty uh, information after the comma just means I'm not subsetting any of the column columns. I'm returning all of the columns. This query would return an error because it wouldn't know what to do with this query on a two dimensional data frame with only a one dimensional um, indexing query. Those are not compatible. So uh, I made a mistake when I, when I typed this into PowerPoint. Uh, but I do have an example like that in the exercise that should function properly. Uh, I'm gonna skip this because I added this to the, uh, uh, the initial, like I added this as a, actually as a separate topic that we just covered before. Um, the one thing I'll cover here is that both this uh, kind of arrow assignment and the equal sign are both assignments, but the arrow is recommended generally in R um, because it can be used anywhere, while the equal sign can only be used in certain situations. I just, people by convention generally like the arrow. Um, that's that's all I really have to say about that. Uh, but we covered that part before. And then um, I just want to jump back here for a second. You'll see that I've combined these two expressions with this and symbol. And that one's new. That's this uh, logical operator where we're looking at this kind of Venn diagram approach where we had say fish over 400 units in length on one circle, and we had fish over one unit in, in weight in another circle. And we wanted the intersection of those two expressions. We wanted the fish that were both over 400 length and over one in, in, in weight. And so that's where that and symbol provided the way to combine those two individual expressions together. Um, and then this straight up and down line, which is like shift and then the backslash that's just below your delete key, that specifies or. We could ask something like we want fish that are, um, say, uh, where's the or? Um, here's the or. Maybe we wanted fish that were over 400 or over one in weight. And if we go back to here, 
then we would have returned this spotted sea trout because while it wasn't over one over in weight, it was over 400 in length. So this is over 400 in, like if we said we wanted fish that were over 400 in length or one in weight, we could return this observation because it doesn't meet the and criteria, but it would meet an or criteria. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about all of these right now. There's many examples for how you can run these online, but I think that um, combining uh, uh, these operators with the visual diagrams can be really useful to understand a little bit more like uh, intuitively the, um, the way that they uh, uh, subset the responses. <coughs> So um, now we're just going to go into a few kind of like general details about working in R. Uh, uh, and then we'll come back to some final bits on indexing and summary statistics. Um, first, I want to just cover naming things in R. You always, if you're assigning uh, uh, something to an object, you always have to start the name of that object with a letter. You can include numbers, or sorry, digits, like zero through nine. You can include dots and underscores. You'll see, I just prefer underscores because that's just, I just develop a preference and I stick with it. Everything is case sensitive. So little n and big n are two different objects. And it's 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 very annoying when you spend like half an hour trying to find what's wrong with your code. And it turns out that you had a little n instead of a big n or something. Um, but if you type out, you know, my name Colton is an object, uh, and I assign another object, little c Colton. Those are two separate things to R. Um, and and, and um, if I wanted to find Colton again, I would have to make sure and type exactly which one of those that I wanted. So uh, it's generally like my, my practice is generally to keep everything underscore or uh, uh, lowercase and put underscores between, between words. Um, you can create long names as pretty much as long as you want, but you have to type them out every time you have to call them back. So the shorter, the better, but sweet is also good in terms of something that you can kind of recognize and remember what it is. So like, like variable is a bad name for a variable. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we'll see some of the namings that I came up with in the exercise. But you want to try to keep it something that you'll remember what it was, uh, but not too long in doing so. And then finally, if you specify an object that already exists, so like say, um, you know, little n equals five, and then I assigned a little n to six later on, little n would be six from there on. A little n, I would never have little n was five, you know, was no longer five. I assigned it to six afterwards. It overwrites what it was previously assigned to without any warning. It just that so you you told me little n was six now, that's what it is. Um, and unless you tell me otherwise, again, I'm just gonna stick with that. So uh, this is kind of um, a list of like different ways people name variables in different programming languages. Um, uh, you'll see this is kind of the snake case. This is what I most commonly use in R. You can't use some of them, like kebab case doesn't work because R thinks these are minus signs. And um, you can't use spaces uh, either. So you could use other ones of these. I just use snake case because it's less work to hit the shift key when you're trying to type this out than some of these other ones would be. And it's nice to have underscores to separate um, uh, the, uh, the words to make it a little more legible. 
Um, there's not much to say on this other than uh, even in your um, directories and files that you're naming, it's best to keep it really simple as well. Don't put any special spaces. It's best not or special symbols. It's best not to put any spaces even. So I tend to, you'll see in my, uh, in the uh, um, kind of like course folder that I'm use snake case for like naming almost everything. Um, uh, even like the, the files and then what's in the files and word documents just kind of becomes a habit. Um, and many things now, it doesn't really matter that much anymore, but uh, in some older programs and things, it can mess things up. So it's best to just keep it simple and not put any special symbols. I already went over commenting code. This is just a reminder to comment, 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 and comment. Um, the only new thing I will comment on here is if you want to skip a line of code, you see I'm commenting, you know, what I'm doing in the code, but say I just wanted to skip like printing this out, I could just put another hashtag before the print and it would just skip that line of code. So the comment doesn't have to be an actual like um, written out statement of what a line of code does. It could be a comment is actually a line of code that I don't want to run at that moment. Um, and so keep that in mind. Uh, but um, that's this that's this part, the prevent and execution of code. Do so this called commenting out a line of code. I could push, put the hashtag right before print and that would no longer be run as I go through the script. Write your code as general and as simple as possible. I give some examples of like, in the exercise we'll see, we'll do some general and then we'll build it up and do some more complex, like how can we do this all in one line of code? Um, document your code as best as possible. And then use spaces like line breaks uh, to separate kind of chunks of different code that belong together. So I was just gonna do one last like, uh, bit of the indexing example before um, before we see some of the basic summary statistics and jump into the exercise. So this is just more um, um, visual of like what the indexing is actually doing so that we can kind of envision this example uh, before we go into the exercise and like just start typing it out and, and doing it. Um, so <laughs> the uh, one thing to notice here is that um, I do have to specify the size dollar sign length again inside these square brackets. Um, so you see me doing that, oops, doing that here. And then I'm asking to return all the rows for the size or for where this data frame size has a length less than 300. Um, and again, the empty comma after the expression here, it means return all columns in the data set. So first let's look at this data set and look down the length field. Here I've just highlighted in gray, all of the rows where the size is less than 300. All right, so I just manually went through and I did this. As I was doing that, I found, hey, here's one, 300. What do you guys think? Is that going to be returned or not? Well, in this expression, I just have simply the less than. So 300 is not less than 300. So that would actually also be excluded in this subset, right? If I had said 300 less than, equal to 300, then this would be true. But in terms of this expression, how it's written, this less than 300, this row does not meet that criteria. So when I run this expression, I'm going to re, uh, or sorry, gosh, I, I said this wrong. Uh, I can't remember what I said now. Um, 
but I want to return only the fish that are less than 300 in length. So I'm looking at just getting back the gray ones, right? And then I've mentioned that this um, uh, yellow highlighted one won't be returned in my data set. So when I run that, here's that set of gray ones. And I can see that they all have lengths less than 300. And then just a comment, I could have also combined multiple expressions. I, I wanted fish that were less than 300 in length and greater than 0.1 in weight or something um, like that. I'm not going to go too into depth on statistics and, and descriptive statistics, but uh, we'll see in the um, uh, exercise that we commonly just want to look at things like, you know, when we first import a data set, how many rows are in our data? How many columns are there? What kind of data is stored in each column? Um, we want to check that each row represents a single observation, and if not, we're going to need to rearrange our data if, if you know to fit that. I'm not going through that in this exercise. If you guys have issues with that, you can contact me individually. Um, but for now, we'll just work with a data set that's already set up like that. And then, if we're looking at individual columns of our data, we could ask things like, "What's the mean or median of our data? What's the standard deviation?" or how, how dispersed is our data around the mean? How many count, how many observations are the count of our, you know, how many uh, um, observations are in here in that data set? Things like that. And so we'll see a lot of these useful summary statistics applied in this exercise. So if you haven't already, uh, if you've just downloaded R in R Studio and you haven't downloaded um, the full like set of um, files from the Google Drive, you'll at least need to go and download this fish length weights. So uh, at the very least, download this file. And you'll just have to save it somewhere where you can remember where it is. It could be in your downloads folder, could be your documents, it could be on your desktop. I don't really care where you save it right now um, because uh, as long as you remember where it is when we go into R, uh, that's, that's the key. And then go, go ahead and open up an R Studio window again. Um, dark mode again, tools, global options, and then appearance. And you'll see you can click through. I have Merbivore soft, but there's a lot of different themes that you can select here. Um, okay, so uh, as we get started here, I just want to highlight again for everyone that uh, I do have this script that follows along with the exercise uh, in tandem, step by step, and is is pretty well uh, commented. Um, and so. Uh, as I go along, I'm going to type things anew so that I can encourage folks at home to type things anew as well. 
<laughs> but I can't guarantee I'll comment everything as well as I did in that um, uh, already saved R script. Um, so I uh, encourage you to comment your own script as you type. If you get lost on commenting things or you feel like I'm not commenting things well enough, just recognize we already have a script that does what we're currently going to do and is commented. And it's also fairly well detailed in these exercise notes. So I wrote these up um, uh, uh, and uh, um, put some screenshots, a little bit of screenshots and some comments on things as best as I could throughout as we go. Um, what, what does what? So everything's fairly well documented. And that's just to say, like, I don't know if I'm going to be great at commenting everything on the fly here because it's just hard to code and comment and talk about what everything's doing all at the same time. Um, so, uh, I have this data set here. I know where it is. It's on my computer. I have it downloaded. There's a few ways to get this into R. I will just, uh, show you, oh, that was, that was not the data set. Um, this one fish length width. Um, uh, the first thing to notice is this is a dot CSV file. That means comma separated values. If you open it in Excel, it will look like a normal table. <laughs> it's limited what you can do with it in Excel because it's not actually an Excel like file, it's a .csv. And it may make more sense if I open it for you in a text editor and show you what it actually looks like, which is not very interesting. But you see the name, of the columns and then the entries and really it's just entries and they're each separated by a comma right you see this comma separating the values hence comma separated values um so uh i didn't cover in my um uh exercise there how to save a comma separated value data set but uh you could you could google this but if you were to create your own spreadsheet and go to save this in Excel, for example, you have the option to save it as a comma, oops, as a comma separated values spreadsheet. Um, uh, and, and that's a really common way to save data uh, and work with for databases uh, or work with for bringing it into R. Um, I'm not going through all of the ways that you could store and save data and import it into R. I've just for now kept these as CSV files. So what does that mean? We're going to use a function called read.csv uh, to import this into R. So the first thing is I'm just going to start by uh, starting to name the data frame that I want to call this thing. And then I'm going to open this function read.csv. Now, there's a couple ways that I could import this data. If I wanted to, I could paste the file path in quotations. So I could go down and I could, and I'm, I'm on a Mac, I right click on the name of the file. And if I hold option down, I get this option to copy file path. You don't have to follow me right now. I'll show you another method in just a second. I just want to highlight um, that uh, I can do that. On Windows, to get the file path here, you hold shift before you right click, and then you'll see an option to copy a file path. And then you can copy a file path there, all right? And you'll see exactly where it's stored on your computer here in R. Now I'm gonna do about it a little bit differently for the sake of this demo. I'm going to call this other function inside read.csv, and this is just called file.choose. So I want you to just type in exactly this line, size, and then this assignment operator, 
and then read.csv with the parentheses. And then inside that first set of parentheses, you'll do file.choose with a new set of parentheses. And then you'll hit enter on that line. And from there, what you'll see is it just opens a file browser. So it's it's like you're you're kind of coding, but you're interacting now with like a, a user interface through our studio. And here you would just navigate to wherever you stored that downloaded file and find it and click open. And then, uh, like I said, whenever I assign something in R, I like to just look at it. You'll see it looks a whole lot like what we just showed in Excel. Um, but it's a lot of rows here. And it's like coming off the page. And so a really helpful uh, function is called head. And you can look at head of size and that will just paste or print the first six rows of that data set instead of printing you know all trying to print all of them you could see it didn't get to printing all of them but here now we can just get a sense of how our data is laid out uh, without you know printing things that take up way more of the console than we have room for to read So we've peeked at our data. We've seen essentially that more or less, it looks like the import process into RStudio captured the data in the same format that we expected as when we looked at it in Excel, right? We have a table. Well, we can see here a little bit about the dimensions of that, but we could also call this dim function and just look at the dimensions of our data and see that it's 15,460 rows by three columns. And we could also ask R about the class of our data. And that tells us that this is a data frame. There's some uh, kind of logical operators in R that, you know, you say, is dot matrix asks R, is this object a matrix? Well, we already know it's a data frame. So no surprise to us that is dot matrix returns false. Is dot data dot frame. Well, that's true, right? Because it is a data frame. And then another useful thing to look at when you import your data is this str function structure. And this kind of tells you just some like high level uh, information about your data that you just imported. It tells us it's a data frame. It tells us there's 15,000 and some observations of three variables. And then it tells us the names of the three variables. And here, when it says three variables, these names are corresponding to the columns in that data frame. And then it tells us some information about those. It says common name is characters, right? So these are actual character strings. Length is integers, meaning these are numerical, but they're all whole numbers. And then weight is numerical. So these are numbers that have decimals. And that tells you some things that you could do. Like we know we could take, again, means of length and weight because we can work with those numbers to sum them up and divide them by however many numbers there are. But we couldn't take a mean of common name because it's a character frame, a character um, field. So uh, let's go back. I'm just going to look at the head of our data frame again. And then let's just do a very basic set of indexing. What if we just wanted to look at and extract this observation? How would we do that? Well, that observation is in the first row. So we do a one for the row. 
and it's in the third column. So we've just pulled that observation out of the data frame. And here it is, 0 0.58. We could also extract a set of observations based on their proportions. So we could say we want to look at rows 10 through 15 of all three columns. And so keep in mind head was the first six observations. Here we're just looking at 10 through 15, some middle set of observations. So some really basic indexing. Um, now I'm going to show how we could uh, remove it like you know index minus an observation so i just looked at size and then i'm going to compare what happens when i do minus two so keep your eye on this observation and then when i run minus two we should see this same size data frame returned but it should not have this striped bass at 667 in it. Okay, so you can see there's no striped bath at 667. So the minus two just asks to return everything except a certain observation. We talked about working with a particular um, column. So say I just wanna work with the length column. These are all those integers from the length column. A few ways that I could call that out. And very commonly you'll see we do size dollar sign length. Now, again, let me do uh, that query from the set of slides that we just asked about. Let me just find all of the fish whose length was less than 300. And how would I go about that? I know I'm going to index into the size object. So I'm just going to start by typing size and putting the square brackets around it. If I want to find the fish whose length is less than 300, I know I'm working with the length field. And it's pretty clear that I'm looking for the fish who have a length less than 300. Um, uh, uh, and then I'm just gonna return all of the columns for that. So I just ran that command. And then you can scroll up through this returned set of data and just scan this middle column for length. And you'll just notice, right, that pretty clearly they're all under 300. So sometimes you'll assign that to a new object. And I often like to look at it and just make sure that, hey, it did exactly what I wanted. Like this, I like to say, hey, did it return only things that are less than 300 in length? Like, yeah, it seemed to. Um, so that makes sense. Um, Just gonna uh, check out this comment really quickly in the chat.
Um, okay, so uh, this query obviously downloaded, or I mean, um, it uh, returned all of the rows for the fish with a size under 300. But let's just break it down a little bit more to see exactly what happened. So in this case, I did just copy and paste the inner part of this uh, indexed expression onto a new line. And I just want to run only the size. Uh, keep in mind here, this first part, um, I'm going to ramble or like talk a little bit over myself in R a little bit. In R Studio, I think in R2, if you highlight just a portion of a line, and hit command enter, it will run just the highlighted portion. So I could run just that. Keep in mind that the size dollar sign length is just returning the column of length. And what happens if we run the whole line asking whether they're less than 300? That returns the whole set of trues or false relative to each length, right? Whether each length was less than 300. When we then have that contained within the square brackets, what that does is it says, return for me from the size, only the rows where this expression was true. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna actually assign this to a new object. I'm gonna do that like this. I have size under 300, and then I've done the assignment operator, and then I've just pasted the same uh, line of code that I had above in the indexed expression of size. When I run that line, you don't see anything actually returned in the console. You just see the um, uh, expression get run, but you see a new uh, object created in the in the uh, environment. Um, of course, I didn't do this in the exercise, but I always like to just uh, look at what I just created. And this looks like what we had just indexed previously with this line, except now I'm just calling it by the assigned name of that object. So now I can just work with that whole set of fish that are less than 300 in length by only typing in this, uh, uh, this um, name, which is, you know, somewhat shorter, at least, than this one. Now, what if I want to know, of all of the fish, how many of them were less than 300 uh, uh, units in length? Well, you might remember, well, I guess the answer is kind of already here. You might remember there's about 15,000 observations in the first data frame, and we found that just by looking at the dimension of it. There's another function that just tells you how many rows are in it, and that's n row. So we could look at n row of size, and we could look at n row of size under 300. And we could see of the 15,000 fish originally surveyed, about 4,000 of them were under 300 units in length. So maybe about a fourth of them. Maybe we want to know some summary statistics about those smaller fish. The summary provides us summary statistics about each of the columns in that data frame. So remember that common name is a character data set or a character um, column. So it can't do all of the, the uh, descriptive statistics that you can with a numerical data set. 
in length and weight, the summary statistics return things like the minimum value. The minimum length is 103. The maximum length, because this is already subset to under 300, no surprise that the maximum length of that is less than 300. The biggest or heaviest fish that's less than 300 units in length is 0.72. Okay, so we can start to understand something in more detail about the, the shorter fish that we have out there. Uh, say we wanted to just work with something about the mean and we didn't wanna call it through this summary function. We could call it through this mean function. And we wanna just say, take the mean of the lengths. So I'm gonna look at the size under 300 and then I'm going to use a dollar sign to call the lengths. Or maybe I want to look at the median of those lengths. Okay, and you'll see here the median of the length matches here. The mean of the length matches here. So just a different way to call it but might be more useful if I actually want to do a calculation with that mean than the way it's stored in this summary table. Um, standard deviation is another common descriptive statistic. And then I'm going to just do a little bit of a confusing one uh, because of the way I name the columns, which is the length of it, which length in this context of the function has no bearing on, or like the, there's no relationship between the function length and what the name of the column in my data frame is. And I can check what the function is doing by calling its help page, it tells me it's the length of an object. What that means is it's actually the number of observations that are in this uh, column. So this 33976 actually should look familiar to you as the same number of rows that are in the data frame are the same number of observations that are in the one column of that data frame. Um, okay. Let's see, uh, some things that we might wanna do with the common name field, because common name is not numeric. Maybe we just wanna know like um, about the different types of fish. So again, I'm just gonna start by running this, this line and remind us that because uh, there are people out there just measuring fish, the same, like multiple, multiple recreational fishers are catching the same kind of fish. Frequently, it looks like white grunt is being caught multiple times. Not the same individual white grunt, but people are out there catching white grunt repeatedly. Um, so if we just wanna know like how many unique different types of fish or like what are the unique different fish that are being caught, we could look at that list and just say, return the unique names in that list. And here you'll see there's 83 unique different fish out of that 3,900. And this is just a list of them. Okay, maybe that's not that useful because we actually wanna know like, well, what's, how many white grunts are being caught versus how many black magrets or golf menhadens are being caught. For that, we would call this table function. And what table does is it's gonna list out the unique ones, but then under those names, it's gonna count up how many times each of those names appear in this, in this um, column, right? So we can see that like this, oh, hey, like sheep's head is a lot more, you know, common than 
uh, saucer eye porgy uh, um, and I'm just going to go through a short exercise here to show you how to create a data frame of this and sort it from largest to smallest so that it may be more useful than even this is um, because this is more this is pretty useful as it is right this tells us these are the fish that are appeared and how commonly they appear uh, but it it's not super useful in terms of the way it's organized in R for doing more analysis on. So we can start by saving that object that we just we just created. I'll just copy and paste this line of code. We did nothing more right now than just assign that output to an object. And then the next thing I'm going to do is just tell R to make it into a data frame instead of a table. And I'll actually just run this so we can look at each output as we go. And so here you can see what happens. It's a little bit more useful. It has, well, var one is just the common name and frequency is the number of times it appeared in that data set. And then the last thing we might want to do to make this really useful for us is just order these instead of by alphabetic order, order them from frequency being most frequent to least frequent. Well, if we wanted to do that. We have to do a little bit of a complex piece of coding here. I'm going to say order, I'm indexing the data frame. And I'm indexing it by the frequency column. And what this is really just doing, you could even just run this inner piece of line and look at what does order do. Order just tells you that uh, oh well, I'm gonna spoil a secret, but in actuality, as we run it right now. This is um, from smallest to largest. So this tells you that Alamo Jack is the ninth least frequent fish that we see. We could run that and look at fish dish. And we see that smallest to largest. I'm going to copy that whole piece of code and paste it again. And I'm going to add inside the order parentheses a comma and say decreasing equals true. So this is another argument to the order function to tell it I actually want to order those from largest to smallest, not smallest to largest. Now I can run that and look at this. And I see now I have the table from largest to smallest and I see that white grunt is the most frequent fish that's observed of, of the fish that are less than 300 units in length. Another piece to keep in mind that since I got a little bit, um, uh, I've assigned things to some, I've Let's see, I'm, I've removed myself from the name of what went into this fish distribution. Oh, I called it fish dish. This is supposed to be dist, like distribution. Um, if you're wondering what in the heck this actually means, it's supposed to be fish distribution. How do you know what distribution this is of the original, the original set of fish? or of those only under 300 units in length. You would have to read these lines of code and it's here where we first assigned it that you see that it's using the object size under 300. So this is made up of only the fish under 300. What is the most common fish 
that's observed of those under 300 units in length. And uh, I've also overwritten um, uh, 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 the object a couple times here so that by the time it comes out, it's no longer a table. It is a data frame, but I've changed its order. Um, and so uh, you can see how that worked. Okay, I'm just going to do a couple more things here. Um, uh, I'm, let's see. I think I'll skip a couple portions of this exercise just for the sake of time and let people come back to them. Um, I'm just going to do what I really don't recommend and copy and paste some pieces of code into here. Uh, this is just a line to show you combining two queries together. So this fish was long and skinny. Or wait, long and light. And this kind of fish was short and heavy. So could you look at, you know, those outputs and guess which one was which, right? If I gave you just these outputs and granted one of them has a couple different kinds of fish, but the most common one that is short and heavy is a sheep's head fish. And the most common one that's long and skinny or light is an Atlantic cut cutlass fish. Could you connect that query to these pictures of fish? Right, probably pretty easily guess which one is which. Um, there's a few other uh, um, things that I covered in the exercise, but I wanna get to um, this T apply function. Oh, I wanna do this one really quickly. Um, what if we just wanna know the mean of like one fish, mean size of one fish? I'm gonna go back to the original size. So I'm gonna ask, is you, are you a black sea bass? And then I can index and return all of the observations that are just black sea bass, right? And if I wanted to know, for example, the mean weight of a black sea bass, I could then call of that object that I just indexed to just the black sea bass, now go into the weight column of that set of data. And then I could take the mean of it. Okay, so this is a pretty complex example. We've gone from you know, individual functions to now really combining everything together into one, like one long line of code. And what your job really is from here is to be able to parse apart that line of code and try to understand what's going on at each step of that line uh, and figure out how is that functioning together to generate this number. Um, this is a very common example of like something that you could break apart into multiple lines of code, right? You could say, uh, and you can just you can just follow along here for a second. These are the black sea bass, right? And I've assigned that to one thing, and then I could take the mean of the black sea bass weights. 
And maybe that's cleaner for you to have it broken up into multiple lines. Maybe it's nice to have it combined into one line. Multiple different people code in different ways. I like to say start by writing your code very simply, as little bit of my line as you can, line by line. But pretty quickly, you'll start to combine and wrap functions around each other. Now, that was the mean of the Black Sea Bath. Could you imagine for all, um, well, I can't remember how many unique fish there were, but there were hundreds, how we could calculate the mean of every unique fish in here. You could imagine changing this to a different fish name, calculating that and moving on. There is a function here that will very easily do that, and it's called T apply. And here, we just tell it, what do we want to break up? We want to break up and calculate means of weights. And how do we want to break it up? We want to group them by their names. So this is going to say, take the weight column in size, group each weight, each set of weights into all of the different common names. So each different common name, like create, essentially create this data frame for every common name. And then for that data frame, calculate its mean. And now you can see we very quickly and easily calculated the mean of every unique type of fish that was caught. You can see how this quickly can become very, very powerful. Um, I'm going to skip actually uh, the rest of the exercise just for the sake of time. Um, there's just a few other steps that I had done in this uh, exercise three exploring data. I will show them for us uh, before we wrap up. So we're right here, step 19, if you want to write that down and just take a note of where we left off. Uh, I was then demonstrated how we could use this tapply function to calculate not just the mean, but the standard deviation and the length of those fish, and then combine those into a single result. And this would tell us for each fish, what was, its, what was the mean of all of the fish, was the standard deviation, and then how many fish were caught or sampled or observed for each of those observations. And then I went through an example of creating a new set of data to combine with that original um, one. So this was a, a, a very simple, um, uh, 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 example, how to define vectors with the C function, some new data, how to create that into a data frame yourself. And then I actually added columns to the data frames to record who the observers were, in this case, Noah, and then me. And then I use this R bind function to combine uh, uh, the two data frames into a new object. Just for the sake of time, I don't wanna cover all of that right now. I just wanna do some of the wrap up questions in the chat. Um, but I just wanna highlight that you're at step 19. There's, there's uh, should fairly easily be able to finish this by yourself or you can always come on the downloaded uh, materials, open up the Explorer data sets and um, uh, work through this step-by-step -step and just see the output on your own. The final thing I wanna highlight um, before uh, we answer the questions on the uh, chat there is that I added a second data set called Washington Fires in this data um, uh, uh, folder. 
And here I've posted a set of questions that you should hopefully be able to answer given the tools that you have up until now. And so I really, really highly recommend if you found this at all interesting or you have any plans to continue using R, that in the next few days to week, you get back in and do some review and try to do this like your homework, you know, essentially to answer these questions. They're not intended to be tricky. They're just intended to get you some additional practice. And you can always reach out to me if you're having any trouble with answering these. Um, I didn't put answers in here. Um, I can work on that if you want, but just feel free to email me if you want to work through these. Um, uh, that's there for you to get some extra practice. So, Laurel, do you want to uh, address the? Um, do you want me to read that about the webinar? Do you want to address that really quickly? You no, know, I can uh, let folks know. So uh, we are offering this uh, training through the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. Um, we will provide this webinar and all the materials that Colton has provided us and provided you in the links, the Google link under our uh, members portal website. Uh, so nafws.org and then log in with your membership information. And there's a ton of information in there uh, that's uh, a per part of the perks for your membership that you'll be able to access in regards to this training, any of the other trainings that we've offered, um, and the recordings uh, for those and any other uh, resources that we're able to provide to you. Um, in addition to that, and along with talking about data and um, analyzing data, there is now a um, an option through the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society for tries to be to gain access to uh, library resources, uh, journal resources. And uh, Sean, I know you're on. Do you want to speak about that a little bit? Just give everybody an update on that. So I think it goes well with the information Colton has provided today just to be able to have uh, folks start gaining access through the agreements that we now have in place with the National Conservation Training Center. Good, Sean. Okay, yeah, sure. So just a quick update. Um, like uh, Laurel said, the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society signed an agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service to provide a number of different types of access to the National Conservation Training Center, one being courses. The next one is um, access to the conservation library. So the members of the society, as far as the library goes, you have access to about 4,000 professional journals. It's millions of articles. Um, it's all the big ones too, you know, like from AFS to conservation biology or whatever you're looking for, the Wildlife Society. Um, and interlibrary loan system, I can't remember how many books they have, like 9,000 books or something. So that you all have access to that as members of the society. And it's a simple search system online through their website. It works really well. I've looked up a number of things now. Um, and I would say I'm getting a lot of emails about that. In fact, I'm kind of like on the side getting them right now, people asking about it. So if I haven't helped you out yet and you're emailing me, keep emailing me because I'm buried right now and stuff. So don't let me forget. And I'm working on, there's also a lag, just so you know, when you pay for your membership, there's a lag time for me to get from our system into the federal system. So it's not like immediate. It takes, it takes like a week or so for the systems to update. So just keep reminding me, and, and if you have questions, email me or call me up. Um, and then the other one with the MOU is society members attend courses at or sponsored by NCTC as if you're a federal employee, or we're putting together a number of classes that we're gonna try to take to the field where you'll be able to attend for free of charge is the goal. So that's kind of where we're at on, on the NCTC system. Thanks, Sean. Colton, do you have anything else to wrap up today or speak about things to prepare for next week? Um, I think nothing to prepare for next week other than if if you weren't able, you know, to get on to the software, uh, I really encourage you to work with, you know, your system admin or IT folks to get access to that or um, 
you know, of course, bring a personal laptop or, you know, whatever you can to uh, uh, work on that. Um, really, really encourage people to do some review on uh, what we did, even if it's just running through the, uh, the script that's already posted in that folder um, and refreshing like what we did. Um, and other than that, uh, yeah, next week should be fairly easy to jump in even if you did not uh, essentially get or follow some of what we did today. Uh, uh, it's not intending to build off much of what we did today. It's, 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 uh, can be uh, a little bit separate uh, from that. So don't feel discouraged from like kind of the statistical part of things, mm -hmm. especially next week will be a lot of graphics and uh, building some, some fun graphics and figures. Some other things for people to consider um, we had, when we first outlined this course with Colton, um, we had talked about trying to maybe develop a in-person workshop at the conclusion of these sessions with Colton to really be able to offer an opportunity for tribes to uh, discuss some of their data needs like in person. Like now you understand that our programming, you know, some of the basics of it, how do you get to that next step? How do you get to that next step with your data? And um, or how do you work through maybe some issues that you might have with your data? And so as we go along, uh, send me an email, uh, Sean an email, you know, you have the questions about the R programming itself, so you can send the Colton, he provided his email at the top of the presentation um, and let us know what you think. You know, is that something that tribes can use in, in terms of setting up an R programming workshop? Um, in-person workshop somewhere. If that is a need that arises out of this type of training, um, we can work to set that up. So just let us know. And with that, I will, it's 104, I'll go ahead and stop the recording, continue to ask questions if you if you want and um, in the chat, or you can turn on your mics and we'll keep providing as much information as we can.